Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of Empowered Living Podcast by Empowered Life Church. We hope it blesses you. To Ezekiel chapter 47. And I want, to, I want you guys to know that the Holy Spirit has been dealing with me all week. And you say, what does that look like? <clears throat> it looks like me and my prayer times. And the Holy Spirit just kind of gently saying to me, you know, you can't make me do something, right? <laughs> and so, and some of you, you, you know me, some of you are new here or whatever. Um, just the way that I'm wired. I mean, it's personality. I know that we all have the fruit of the Holy Spirit and patience is one of them. That to me is the sour fruit, you know. I'm working on that one. But I, I'm very tenacious. When I want something, if it's of God, I pursue. I'm not a quitter, never been. And so for me, just the, when I was in Brazil and just seeing people worshiping God and then going to Portugal and seeing people encounter God, I came here and I wanted to see our church on fire. And the Lord began to speak to me and said to me, do you think you're the only one hungry for me in your church? And I went, oh God, I'm so sorry if I came across as though I'm the only one hungry for you, Lord, forgive me. And the Lord began to just deal with me all week, so I repent to you guys, and as Papa's been dealing with me, um, my heart is that every person in this room would experience the living God, and that you would encounter him, and, and I know that's your heart as well, and I know that there's people in all different levels in your journey, and for those of you that are new or you're visiting, as we gather together in the presence of the Lord, it's so critical to know that he is here with you, and he's here to speak to you and heal you and minister to you. And, and for me, there's something about having a focused, undivided heart before God. How many of you know there's a lot of things that distract us? Yeah. Yeah. And so, so some of the intensity is good, but we're going to look today at how the Holy Spirit is like water. How many of you know, unless it's coming out of your sink, you can't control a river? Amen? Amen? And so turn me to Ezekiel chapter 47. I'm going to read just a, chat a little bit, and then I'm going to bring Audra up to share something. Uh, pray for Erica. She sounds like she's smoked a uh, pack of cigarettes or whatever. <laughs> she's got some kind of upper respiratory thing. She's like, hi, man, I love you. Have a good day. Sounds like Marge Simpson's sisters. Anyway, sorry if you're watching, love. Um, <laughs> I love when Erica's here because I could just look at her face and I just know, okay, shift gears. When she's not, I just go. And, uh, but she was going to share a little too, so maybe next week. In Ezekiel chapter 47... Let me just start off by saying, Ezekiel had no clue what he was seeing. This is a vision that makes no sense to the prophet Ezekiel. There's no context for a river that flows out from the temple. There's no context for this. Um, I want you to remember, during this time, Moses' tabernacle was erected in such a way where only the high priest could go beyond the veil once a year, and even their clothing had to be removed and had to be handled special because the clothing couldn't just touch anyone and make them holy. So we're talking about the holiness is the deeper you go into the temple. Does that make sense? Am I saying that in a way you guys understand? So this right here makes no sense to Ezekiel. In my vision, the man brought me back to the entrance of the temple. So Ezekiel, you know, the last 10 chapters, he's seeing different visions. And the man he's talking about is believed to be an angel. And it's an angel, and he's holding a measuring rod, okay? So that's the context before the measuring rod is what the angels he's, he's addressing. There I saw a stream flowing east from beneath the door of the temple and passing to the right of the altar on its side. I want to stop there for a moment because it's easy to skip past and just read the entire text, and it's powerful. But I, I believe you don't have the rest of the text without this one passage which talks about the stream that flows over the altar. And I want to speak to you about this. This is something that I've been pondering and I've been meditating upon. And it was the responsibility of the priest to keep the fire burning continually upon the altar. So in times of revival, whatever word you want to use, one of the things I want to encourage you is not to debate semantics, but just to get it. Yes. Whatever Jesus is doing, outpouring, awakening, revival, I don't want to debate it, I just want it. <laughs> And so I've had to avoid commenting on Facebook with, uh, it's always the uh, uber intellectual that has no church. 
and they have so much, oh, wait, okay, see? That's just, and they want to tell you about, you know, what the moves of God are. See, Sunday morning, this, this morning, as we were gathering together, how pleasing is that to the Father to see his kids gathering together and just saying, Hosanna, you're worthy. Like, oh, it moves the heart of God. And so, yes, you carry the Holy Spirit in you, absolutely. And so in that regard, you're revivalist. You bring the presence of God everywhere. But there's something that happens when we gather together corporately. The Bible says God inhabits the praises of his people. There's a special presence. And that's what's happening is there's a sweet presence of the Lord that is being poured out. But what's interesting is it's the responsibility of the priests to keep the fire burning continually. So why in history do we see outpourings of the Holy Spirit? You know, it's interesting, a lot of things that are happening, um, even with the movie that's coming out with the Jesus Revolution. Some of you experienced that in the 70s, where there was an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, where hippies, you know, I'm using the language that you would hear of that day, so don't take offense, um, but it's like these barefoot, dirty hippies, they started going in the church, and they were barefoot, literally, and, or the girls were wearing uh, bathing suits, because this is like Costa Mesta, uh, California. So they're walking into the church where everybody had their Sunday best on, and they're coming in, you know, half-dressed, barefoot, dirty, and in the carpets, and worshiping God with their whole heart. And there was a huge tension that happened within the, the church because the religious are like, oh my gosh, you know, look at that way the girl's dressed. And I'm thinking, well, why is your husband staring at her then? See, that was good. You guys missed it. Anyway, but that's what was happening was this tension of like people are getting saved and, and these hippies were having encounters in such a way that the religious didn't have a grid for. As an example, they were get, taking uh, acid. And I'm not saying you should take acid to encounter God. But Jesus would meet them and then they would quit doing drugs and then many of them are still saved today. Not only are they still saved today, but they're the leaders of most of the churches with influence were these people that had revival. So then if you study revival, which has been one of my passions, the Welsh revival is probably one of my favorite revivals to study, and it happened in Wales. And the leader, Evan Roberts, he just kind of asked the pastor, can I have a few minutes and just to invite people to tarry, you know, wait on the Lord with me, and using my words now. And, and the pastor was like, well, at the end of the service, if anybody shows up, and just a handful of young people showed up, and he just gave the invitation of what he believed God was saying to him, and they prayed, bend us, Lord. Understand the terminology, if you're stiff-necked, you cannot be bended. Stiff-necked speaks of rebellion, pride. So bend us means move my heart, you know, make me pliable. And they began to gather, and in this outpouring, Evan Roberts at times would just sit down in his chair for hours, and he would not get up until he felt the Holy Spirit prompt him to get up. And people would come, and theologians would fly in, and they would want to come and correct it because they knew how to do it. And they'd go in and they'd go, whoops, and they're just tearing in the presence of the Lord. Someone would get up and begin to sing spontaneously. And then somebody else would sing, and they would have, the congregation would all know the words by the Spirit. So a lot of the prophetic worship, you hear that terminology, was birth. Obviously, you see it in the Tabernacle of David. But it was resurrected in the Welsh Revival. Worshiping God in spirit and truth. And that revival spread throughout Wales. So, uh, it was so impacting that the, um, the guy, the mine, what are they called? The guys that work in the mine. Uh, anyway, miners, yeah. <laughs> I, got, I got the black lung pop. Anyway, that's a bad reference. But um, the miners, they had trained their animals and their donkeys by curse words. And they were getting so convicted by the Holy Spirit that they could no longer call their animals to come to them because they wouldn't cuss. The last person to get saved was the sheriff because he was so mad that he, hadn't, he didn't have a job anymore. Now, what happened to that revival? If you go back to Wales, there's a beautiful church, and that's it. There's no signs of it. So why do revivals come, and why do they go? Some believe that is the nature of revival. But according to that passage of Scripture, it's the job of the priest to keep the fire burning continually. When revival goes out, it's because we stop stewarding the flame of God in our hearts. So yes, we do need to be revived or awakened again, but you don't have to live chasing revival. 
The goal is that you have a burning heart after God. So in this passage of Scripture, the river flows where? Across the altar. I know I say this a lot. Maybe I don't have to say it. Maybe I should stop saying it. But I've been doing ministry for a little bit. And I have this privilege of spending time with people that are my heroes. And so uh, I meet with people. I'm not trying to name drop. It's just people that I have so much respect for. And, and they're in their 80s. And they're burning for Jesus. And they serve the church. Not so much of the amens there. <laughs> yes! Burn for Jesus! Serve the church. See? Oh, well, I got something to do on Friday. You know, I would, I would help out. But these are people that love the bride. They absolutely love Jesus. And it's impossible to love Jesus and not love his bride. And so what I see so often in the North American culture is that we think that in our 20s, you do all that serving. And then as you get older, you just leave it to the young people. <laughs> what? That's terrible. M martial arts, which I know... It's probably weird to bring that up in the church. But as I grew up, I did martial arts since I was seven years old all the way into my 20s, and I still dabbled with not the new age and all that, but just kicking and punching. And I know that when I show up to the dojo, that that older man, even though that older man, I could whoop him because he's older, he's gone through every one of the belts that I've gone through. Right? There's never a place where the, instruct, the master just arrives I no longer have to serve. I'm no longer called to love people. I used to do outreach, but I don't anymore. I don't know where we've come up with that. It's an American thing. I think it's an entitlement thing. I had the privilege of having lunch with Heidi Baker, and I totally embarrassed myself like I do. <laughs> I was like, so how you doing? What are you doing? Where are you going? Where are you going free? What are you doing now? I was like, whoa, because I was nervous. And she was just sharing and talking and interviewing us and just... And just hearing her, one of the things that she said, she was like, yeah, when I minister in Brazil, you know, I, I, I just fast. And, and, and a lot of times, you know, the meeting, there's so many meetings that I just don't eat until I get on the airplane. And the pastor's like, oh. So a lot of people don't even believe in fasting anymore. Like our form of Christianity lacks edge. It lacks sacrifice. It, it, it lacks, it's like, that's a young people thing. That doesn't make sense. We need the wise <sighs> matriarchs and patriarchs to burn in order to show the next generation what it looks like to burn. And so the altar is that place. Between the porch and the altar represents a place where I lay myself down as a living sacrifice so God's fire can consume me. And what I wanted my wife to share was when we, you guys hear me, I'm up here and she's so quiet in her personality, but... Every sacrifice that I've made, we've made together as a couple. And there was a season where the Lord was calling us to go to YWAM, and we had to raise $40,000, and I was working as a youth pastor, and I went to our leadership team, and they didn't want me to go. They, ha you know, they knew the plans they had for me. <laughs> they, I was supposed to be a part of taking over the church leadership, and, um, and I just knew it wasn't my inheritance. And so my wife and I went to the leadership and told them what we felt the Holy Spirit telling us. And they said, uh, oh, man, that's, that's, wait, what? And then I said, how much is it? And I told them, and they went, ha, well, if you can raise that, then it must be God. Wow. Right? Well, guess what? The money came in. Yeah. Not through manipulation. You know, I actually tried to step it up, and I actually was going to, I traveled all over, through, I don't even want to say the network, but, you know, I'm going to say it. Um, the full, because it's kind of funny, full gospel businessmen. So businessmen, I get invited to do a tour among all these businessmen that are super successful. It was the weakest giving ever. <laughs> I was like, you guys are businessmen. I think it was the Lord. And then at the end of this tour where I drove all through Canada preaching, I come back with less money. I spent money. I lost money. And I was raising money. And the Lord said to me, you've done it your way. You're ready to do it my way. So I'm like, this is like a constant for me you might keep hearing, okay? And so, and so my wife, you know, she tells the story of like, you know, our desire was obviously to be close to our mother-in-law and our family and our mom and dad. And, and just all of a sudden as a mom, Erica having to count the cost of maybe YWAM will send us to Turkey. Right? 
And we have these three little kids and all of our dreams of the house on the hill, right? And the land and, and just like, God, we're willing to sacrifice everything again for you. We're willing and the sacrifice, you know, and, and that's very much a YWAM thing. You guys would love it is, is, um, is repenting of your entitlements. You guys would love that message. It was rough because you go to a third world nation and you show up on time and you're hungry and they show up two hours later. And you want to tell them that they should change, but this is their culture. And there's so many things like that that you're having to constantly die to self, right? Even though we've been crucified with Christ, there's things that we have to die to. And so Erica, her part was she was in the living sacrifice or sacrifice whatever it is that you call us to do. We didn't know where God was going to send us. You know where he sent us? Talon, Oregon. (laughs) Is the mission field here? How many know that's funny, but it's true? I think the biggest church in Southern Oregon might be about 500 people right now. A town of 200,000. How many of you know we need some revival? We need some stirring, don't we? Um... But Erica's been feeling the exact same way that God has been inviting her into like, hey, you're getting a little comfortable. Are you willing again to give me that same heart's cry that you did 10, 11 years ago? And so I want to look at all of you in the face with respect and love and honor. I don't care how old you are. God's older than you. <laughs> right? Well, if you only knew, I'm, I'm 70 years old. And? And Caleb was 76 or something. I forgot how old he was. And he said, God, I want my mountain. You're never, you never arrive at the place where you just get up off the altar and then you're just an expert in the church. And Stop it. If you're an expert, where's the fruit? Right? Oh, I've been to church for 20 years. That's great. Have you brought a friend this Sunday morning? <laughs> On the way here, did you heal anybody? Oh, you mean you're an expert at going to church. Oh. So there is a stirring that's happening. I want, I want Audrey to come up and share about this thing of sacrifice because we've been praying together as a team, and, and she said something that just hit me super hard. So just this is Audra. She is our administrator. And I want you to, she's going to share for a few minutes. Good morning. So the Lord's been putting, or has put something on my heart lately, and it's time, and specifically generosity with my time with him. And as I've just kind of been resting this, um, this thought of time, what does that mean? What does it mean to be generous with my time? Um, I'm going to read to you a verse um, it's from 2 Corinthians chapter 9, 6 through 8, and it's from the Passion Translation. Um, and I love the title. It's called Hilarious Generosity. <laughs> a stingy sower will reap a meager harvest, but the one who sows from a generous spirit will reap an abundant harvest. Let giving flow from your heart, not from the sense of religious, religious duty. Let it spring up freely from the joy of giving, all because God loves hilarious generosity. Yes, God is more than ready to overwhelm you with every form of grace so that you will have more than enough of everything. Everything. You know, a lot of times I think about generosity and finances was what comes to mind. And I just love how this says, so that you will have more than enough of everything. Every moment and in every way. He will make you overflow with abundance in every good thing you do. So last Sunday, I was on my knees in worship, and I was hungry and crying out to the Lord, Lord, I give you everything. I give you my marriage. I give you my kids. I give you my worship. I give you my job. I give you all the things. Time came to my mind, and I said, Lord, I give you why was it hard to give, me, give him my time? It was hard. I paused. Lord, I give you my time. Why was that so hard? And I felt that 
you know, a lot of the times when things are hard and we have a lot going on, the first thing we do is we start pulling back with our time. Well, I'm not going to go to that service because I need to rest. Um, I'm not going to go do this because, well, I didn't have enough time today. <laughs> um, you all know I'm busy, right? <laughs> you know, so it's like, I have two jobs, I have this, I have that, and it becomes an excuse. And I had to sit there in that moment while I was on my knees and I had to repeat it over and over and over again until I believed that I could give him my time. Lord, I give you my time. Lord, I give you my time. Lord, I give you my time. My time is yours, all of it. So instead of thinking that we have to draw back and go, I'm going to take my time for me, he's saying, come to me. Because you get the refreshing. You get the, the rest. You get the breakthrough. You get all the things that you are desiring, that your heart needs in that moment just by coming to in his presence and going to him and giving him your time. So that's something I'm just really practicing doing is just surrendering my time. And I, in a conversation this week, I actually um, was reminded that any time that we spend with him is not wasted time. You know, I think that because I am busy, there's, a, there's this excuse and this ability to say, well, I just didn't have time. And when you're with him, he has this way of miraculously being able to multiply your time or release the burden off your shoulder so it's not quite so hard to get those things done. He has that ability. So it doesn't mean we surrender all of our responsibilities and all the things that we have to do, but you come to him with your time, and he has a way of making your time for the kingdom and everything we're doing is for that reason, right? Wow. So I just want, and yeah, so I just wanted to say too with the, the outpouring, um, you know, I was listening to a lot of the testimonies from the Asbury, the university, and um, I was just like, oh Lord, you know, I want an outpouring, I want revival, I want that. And in the, in the sense of time, he said, you know, what started as a chapel that they were required to come to was a 45-minute chapel. They had to go Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, and they had a 45-minute chapel. And they all showed up. And then when time was done, the choir kept going. And when the choir needed a break, well, the people kept worshiping. It wasn't about just being there. It was as they poured out to the Lord in worship, he overflowed back to them. So, you know, I just, I've been challenging myself to just do that. Lord, I'm just going to show up and I'm going to worship you. I'm going to praise your name. I love you. And guess what? He's going to, he's going to pour that back at me. So anyway, thank you for listening. Hey, good. There's a scripture in the book of Revelation that says, come buy from me gold refined in fire. And it's one of the only verses where you see come buy. Everything else is freely given, freely, freely received. And um, uh, from me, um, you know, what's the cost of this gold refined in fire? And he said, the Lord told him, it's your life, but I'll take your time for now. And we're so self-protecting. We don't realize that. We just, we're so guarded. We're so our time. And we're so, and, and ultimately... What you're called to be is a living sacrifice to Jesus. And there's something that happens when you learn to flow with the Lord. You don't have to constantly self-protect. Let's look at Ezekiel chapter 47, all right? So thank you, Audrey. That was amazing. Let's start in verse 3. And he's talking about this river. That's verse 2, actually. The man brought me outside the wall through the north gateway and led me around to the eastern entrance. There I could see the water flowing out through the side of the east gateway. And he measuring as he went, he took me along the stream and the... 1750 feet and led me across the water. So it goes up to the ankles. And then another 1750 feet and led me across um, this time the water up, up to my knees and another. And it was up to my waist. Then he measured another. And the river was too deep to walk across. It was deep enough to swim in, but not too deep to walk through. So say, go deeper. Go deeper. <sighs> There's deeper still. There is always more of God. And I want to encourage you that in this vision, vision that Ezekiel is having, the man is leading him, and he's saying, you're going from ankle deep, come on, go a little deeper. We're going knee deep, come on, go a little deeper. Waist deep, come on, go a little deeper. How do you know if you're at that place where the water level is over your head? 
you've given up. Let me see if I say this correctly. God doesn't want to control you. You see that through the Adam and Eve and the fall, so on. He wants a partnership with mankind. But it's, it's where, where, in an essence, you're, so you're yielding to God. Every area of your life is being surrendered, where you're over your head in that regard. How do you know if you're walking in that level, it looks like love? Yeah. Not, oh, I'm too busy, I can't talk to you, oh, I can do this, oh, self-protect, 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 you know. <laughs> that, that is the opposite of love. And we're so concerned that if we don't have all these boundaries, and we read the boundary book, and... Protect other people from you. When I'm burnt out, I need to protect myself from you. It's not to self-protect. We have gone from religious church hurt to way over here where we have so much boundaries, we're like, we're, we're alone and divided. Because we're not willing to open up our doors and let people in our house. <laughs> we're starving for friendship, but we won't invite anybody out for coffee. The gathering here is for the presence of God, for worship and the word. It's not a home group. This isn't time for fellowship with Jesus. So what are you doing on Tuesday? Oh, now you can feel the, me stepping on toes. Is the water level over your head? Are you in a place where you're completely relying and trusting upon the Holy Spirit? Oh, I did that and I got burned out. Because you probably didn't flow with the Holy Spirit. At some place, he said, stop, he said, wait, he said, pause, and you kept going. It's amazing to watch. So God wants us to go deeper. The next thing I want you to see is, he is having to follow the man's lead. Are you still following the Lord? Where's he taking you? Where are you going? It's a good question. Do you, do you know where he's taking you? Has he given you a vision? Well, the scripture says, for the joy set before us, he endured the cross. I want you to pause for a moment. You will only sacrifice if you know the reward at the end of the, you know, the, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. There's no reason to sacrifice if you don't realize that there's a reward. Right? Why would you go to the gym and push yourself so hard if you weren't having an expectation of, you know, looking ripped like me up here? <laughs> so that's why people don't sacrifice anymore, because they've lost their sense of vision and purpose in God. And so then life becomes all about what I can manage and what I can control instead of, take me anywhere. I'm not, you know, <clears throat> oh. Ever seen that? Catch me up in your story all my life for your glory. Take me when, anywhere. I'll do anything. Just put your glory in me. We're like, that's a good youth song. Now, what if God visited you? Retired? Your job right now where you're in? And he said, hey, right now in Turkey, they just had devastation. Would you go there and sacrifice a little of that retirement? Maybe don't buy the fifth wheel. Maybe a little bit of that resources and you go there and you distribute some food. And that's when you know if you're, if you're yielded. When the Holy Spirit starts to ask you to do things and all of a sudden you go, ah! <laughs> The water level's rising. Follow his lead. Allow him to transform you. I want to keep reading. I want to move on. because. And verse 6, he asked me, son of man, he led me back along the river bank. I'm just moving. I'll just read all this. Have you been watching, son of man? Then he led me back along the river bank. When I returned, I was surprised by the sight of many trees growing on both sides of the river. Then he said to me, this river flows east through the desert into the valley of the Dead Sea. I'm going to interject here a little theology. Whenever you see God's people moving east, that's not good. East represents away from God. East represents moving towards sin. Adam and Eve, when they fell, they moved east. You'll see the pattern throughout Scripture. When they're returning, they go west. So this river is going east. It's going after the people. Yeah. I've been praying so hard about, God, we want to host your presence here. And I keep seeing these images. 
And I'm like, God, what are you showing me? And everything that I'm seeing is about his wind and his spirit moving here and going out of the building. He doesn't just want Christians just soaking and not leaving. <laughs> so I, often I sound mean, but it's not that I mean. It's that you have to hear what the Holy Spirit is doing. If the Holy Spirit is saying, get filled up and take, take my presence with you, saturate the city, but you're not willing to do that, then are you really surrendered to the Holy Spirit? It's not easy. To, where's the sacrifice of coming here this morning? You drive, a little cold in the morning, scrape the window. <laughs> I think God's asking us to lay back down on the altar. And he's asking a little more. And I'm looking at some of your faces. I wish I had a mirror. You guys look shook. <laughs> you look shook. Is Jesus your Lord? I know he is. I'm telling you. Some of you are counting the cost. You're like, Ivan, I've done missions. And you've done? Be a missionary. Everywhere. What are you afraid of? Do you not trust him? You're not trusted if he leads you? That he won't provide for you or protect you? The safest place to be is in the will of God. Not just home. <laughs> All right. I want to read. I want to show you. Sorry, I didn't highlight some of the stuff. So I want to show you what this river does very quickly. It flows through the desert into the valley of the Dead Sea. That's prophetic. The river's touching dead things. The water of the stream will make the salty waters of the Dead Sea fresh and pure. When we draw, we allow the river of God to fill us and touch us. It brings purity to our hearts. You can't make yourself holy. Holiness comes from God. It comes from His nature, His character. There'll be swarms of living things wherever the water of this river flows. So where the water touches, it brings life. What do you look like fully alive? What are the things that God has spoken to you about? What are the dreams in your heart, Right? What, did he say to write a book? Did he say to create a podcast? Did he say to hike and pray? Did he say to spend more time with your kids? When, when the river of God touches you, all of a sudden you come alive to purpose. It doesn't become hard because you've already surrendered. You've yielded. And then it goes on to say, fish will abound in the Dead Sea for its waters will become fresh. What's it talking about? Whenever you see fish, we're talking about the harvest. We're talking about souls, people running to Jesus, where this river flows. What happens when we as believers realize in John chapter 7, I'm getting ahead of myself, rivers of living water spring forth from your innermost being. What happens when we realize that the world needs what the church carries, which is the presence of God? Where actually, they probably won't come to church, like running in the church. So what does that mean? That we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We're called to go out to where people are and allow them the taste of the river of the Holy Spirit, whether it be through a kind act, whether it be through an embrace, whether it be through a word of knowledge, a gift of prophecy, a healing, blessing, where all of a sudden they taste of the water and something in them makes them come alive. It's like, man, when I talked to you, I was reminded of my purpose. I was reminded of the dreams that God placed in my heart. Just being in your presence, that's the river flowing. Um, fishermen will stand along the shores of the Dead Sea all the way from En Gedi and fish of every kind. Ha, say every kind. every kind. Fish of every kind. Lord, bring every uh, diversity of cultures together. It was my heart to plant a Hispanic church, to have a, a Spanish church, um, and, and all of us together. And it was so hard because I think most of us, um, let me see if I'm saying this the right way, I don't want to offend anybody. The, the, the culture that we're working with, they wanted their own service. I didn't want to have our own service. I wanted us to be a family. We'll learn how to, we'll have a translator and we'll, we'll share, but it was this division, no, we need our own thing. I don't want that. <laughs> the river should come and flow and there should be all types of diversity in this room. Young, uh, old, college age, all ages, black, white, Chinese, all. And I know we live in Southern Oregon, and there's like, I'm the darkest guy in this city. But anyway, and so, but, but that's, I'm talking about the church at large. Yeah. It should be a house of prayer for all nations, not just the white church up the road, the Spanish church, the black church, the Asian church. The most divided day of the week is a Sunday, where we go to where we feel comfortable. 
I think the river wants to flow and break us out of that. Amen? Fruit trees of all kinds. Fruit is produced from the river. The leaves of these trees will never <clears throat> turn brown and fall, and there will always be fruit on their branches. There will be a new crop every month for their water. By the river flowing from the temple, the fruit will be for food and the leaves for healing. Ezekiel is seeing this vision. This makes no sense. The river flowing across the altar and, and going east and touching people makes no sense. When you study church history, you don't see any temple that's done this until John chapter 1, verse 14, and it says, The word became flesh and dwelt, the word there is tabernacled among us. Jesus is the living temple. He's the fullness of God. All the types and shadows of the temple point to Christ fulfilled. It's not a building, it's a person. You see this in John chapter 4 as well, the same thing. Um, I'm going to share this very quickly. I feel like I'm giving too much information. John chapter 4, the woman's at the well. Jesus gives her a word of knowledge. She says, sir, I perceive thou a prophet. And then she asks the question, some say, the Jews say in Jerusalem you worship God. The Samaritans say it's in Samar Samaria. So what's her question? Where do I find God? You're a prophet. You made me hungry for God. Where do I find him? That's our question. That's the question that we all have. What is the answer? He says, a day is coming and now is. There's the tension there. A day is coming and now is. When those who worship must worship the Father. They must worship the Father. And how do you worship him? In spirit and truth. In spirit, the deepest part of your being. And truth means nothing hidden. It's and religious and weird. No, you come to him with your whole heart. So Jesus Christ, he is the temple of God. He is holy, and everywhere he goes, he's bringing life. He's forgiving sins. He's bringing miracles. And in Jesus, the Holy Spirit resting upon him, and in him, there is fruit constantly. There's no burnout in Jesus. There's no bitterness in Jesus. Right? Temptations come. We deal with those things. But stay in the river. Maybe this is going to offend some of you. Stay thirsty, my friends. It's a commercial, right? But stay thirsty. Are you thirsty for the river of the Holy Spirit? Are you still longing for, like, it's not that you're desperate like you're an orphan. No, you're a child of God. But the desire to spend quality time. As my kids get older, I have a desire to spend more time with them. Right when they're little, they're like, daddy, daddy, daddy. Now that they're older, they want to hang out with their friends all the time. I'm like, hey, what do you guys want to do? I want to hang out. I'm cool, right? I'm cool. It's about quality time spent with God where his spirit begins to fill you. And as his spirit is filling you, it's bringing life and it's bringing healing. It's bringing revival. And then what happens is that river is supposed to flow through you. Yes. <sighs> and let's just simplify it. Love is how it flows. So when you hear me kind of like, it's about God, people, it's about God, don't think I'm saying it's not about people. You're missing it. If I just try to love you from my human love, you know, what's the C.S. Lewis's teaching? Um, eros love, eros is like a lust, uh, phileo love, brotherly love, stoige love, family love, agape love, God's love. You can love your mom and dad and stoige love. But even that love will let people down. The command isn't love each other, love each other, love each other. That's the old covenant. And the new covenant is love each other as I have loved you. Which means, which means another scripture says, um, I'm trying to think of John chapter 3, 1 John chapter 3, it says, um, love comes from God. We love because he first loved us. So the command of love each other, love each other, love each other. You know why it's hard to get believers to do evangelism, get believers to pray, get believers to gather? You know why? Because we're not receiving his love. When you receive the love of God, you love like God. When you spend time in God's real presence, you want to be like him. You want to do the things that he does. So my temperament wants to beat everybody to do something for God. And that lasts like a week, and then I'm tired. And then the Lord goes, hey, you know what's better? Point people to me. 
And then when you get in the presence of the Lord and he begins to fill you with love and forgiveness and accept it and you start to burn for him, it is so easy, like King David says, the cup of my heart runneth over. You know what else the Bible says? My people will volunteer freely in the day of his power. You know what happens? Like an Asbury. I bet right now if they put something, there's an outpouring happening in a college. I keep mentioning it. Uh, Audra said it. Thousands of people are showing up, waiting three hours or more just to get in line, just to worship and pray. There's not one person necessarily, the personality leading it or anything like that. It's just student-led. And now they, they're banning cell phones and, and you know, screen, uh, Facebook um, streaming. They're banning that. And now they're, now they're shutting it down to public because they don't want people just to come and be a looky-loo. This is something holy and sacred God is doing here among the college students. You want it? Go home and do it. <laughs> I got to run there and get it. You got it. It's Christ in you. Burn. Be hungry like these kids are hungry. This is my frustration. I go to Bethel and I experience God. Wow, I'm so glad he lives there. That's Old Testament thinking. If you knew that he lived in you, and when you walk into the room, and if it's dry and dead, you go, I'm just going to let my river flow. All right. Jesus, thank you, Lord. Okay. All right, so I wrapped it up in a little bow. Jesus is the temple. Christ is in you. I want to do something. I want to shift here. And I promise this won't be the service that never ends. Rachel, would you come up here? <laughs> God's been speaking to me. I don't know how much to share. But he said to me, Ivan, you've known me as fire. And I have. That's been my ministry. He says, now I'm going to teach you my presence like water. And I'm like, I like fire. Fire! <laughs> and water's like, you kind of got to like flow. And so as I was waiting on the Holy Spirit, who said, uh, he gave me people that he wanted to release. So Rachel's our missionary. We sent her to Bethel. And... <laughs> And we love her, and she's Robin, uh, Tammy's daughter. And so Rachel, not only is she going to the school, um, we support her, but um, they're having an outpouring among the students there. And when I heard that the Holy Spirit was pouring out among the students, I was like, I'm going to do anything in my power to get her here, to lay hands on those who are hungry. So I believe in that. And um, she's like, God told me I'm supposed to be here on Sunday. And it felt like I was supposed to come to the church and pray for people. I'm like, oh. Okay. <laughs> so Rachel is a Diaz. So I think I'm going to stand up here with my, no, I'll let her hold the mic. You know, some of you don't get the joke. <laughs> she's, Rob, she's Rob's daughter. That's, sorry. Did I just quench the Holy Spirit just now? Okay. No. Aren't you sure? <laughs> Hi, guys. How are you? <laughs> Um, so I, as you know, go to Bethel, um, but one thing that the Lord really put on my heart to share is that you don't have to be at Bethel to get what I have, <laughs> to get what the Lord is doing. Um, the difference actually is that, um, we are learning exactly what you guys are learning here, but it's being ingrained in us every single day and not just on Sundays or Wednesdays or a service. Um, so the Lord really put that on my heart to share that if you apply, you take what Ivan is amazingly teaching you, this, these great tools that he's giving you, and you apply it every single day. You look over your notes and you pray about it and you're meditating on that, then you're going to get your breakthrough. It doesn't, it's not just always handed to you. So I went to Bethel and I was like, I'm going to get all this stuff, and it's just going to happen immediately. And as soon as I got there, the Lord was like, I thought he was not speaking. <laughs> I was like, Lord, what's going on? So um, I was in this season, and I was like, Lord, 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 where are you? What's going on? Why am I not hearing you? And he said, Rachel, I don't just speak through words. I speak through pictures, through signs, through numbers, through the word. And I didn't get that through my head. So the Lord put on my heart to do a fast from media, from 
music that didn't glorify him from all other things and to change my attention and change my tune toward the Lord. And when I did that, immediately I started seeing everything that he was doing. And I started to receive my royal identity and receive my daughtership and my princesship. And he started to reveal to me and unravel what he's already been doing in me that I literally was just not paying attention to. So as soon as I stepped into that and stepped into my identity, everything else started to get pushed out. And um, that's all it takes. That's what happens. When you ask for more of the Lord and you ask, fill me, fill me, fill me, he pushes everything out on its own. You don't have to pray and be like, Lord, please get rid of this. And that's good. And that's amazing. But he will do it for you if you just keep asking him to fill you. So with identity comes knowledge and knowing and pushing everything else out and being for only the Lord. Um, So we have had a revival happening. Um, And from my perspective, a lot of people have said different things like, oh, it started here, oh, it started here. Um, But from my perspective, just being there, it started with a young man who is really popular in the media right now. He's very, he's openly homosexual. He um, does drugs, takes psychedelics, um, does all of the new age worldly things. And he stood up at church last Sunday and declared and confessed to everybody that he was wrong. And that shifted and changed. And he said, Jesus Christ is the only way. He is my savior. An entire generation changed their minds. An entire generation started to shift and change and said, oh, if this guy can do it, why can't I do it? If he's been stuck in the pits, why can't I do it? So from then, it kind of changed, and there was a lot of younger people there. And um, after that, we had school on Monday, and we had worship, and people were just pressing in, and there's this new unlocked element, and they're like, Lord, do it again. Asking, Lord, do it again. Bring the revival. Revive. Rejuvenate. Make us new. And worship just never stopped. (laughs) So people, the Lord was telling people to pack a bag and to stay for days, and it has not stopped. We had to move out of the church because it was a little getting too big, and we had to have service in school. So it's moved into people's houses now, and um, they're still doing it. It's still going. I've been to several of them. And every time I go, it's, it's not a direct mindset change. It is hunger. You walk into the room, and it's hunger to see the Lord move and change different young people. Because if he can do it, why can't we do it? If he is one of the most worldly people and he changed and he said, I was wrong, why can't we do it too? So that is what he's doing. Isn't that amazing? (laughs) So my sound guys like it when I use this one. Um, Isn't that amazing? Uh, And some of you don't know Rachel, but what God's doing with her is so powerful, and she can preach, too. <laughs> this is what I've been praying for, and some of you have heard me for a long time say this. And I, when I was in Brazil and Portugal, and I'm praying for people, and, and I'm praying for young people, I think the people watching think I'm just so compassionate praying for these kids, but really, I'm praying for my kids. As I lay hands on, on their kids, I'm like, God, touch my sons that they would want. And I'm weeping, and they're like, oh, you really love them. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I'm praying for your kids. Yeah. Yeah. Almost every person in this room, historically, we've had an outpouring. If you're, you know, depending on your age, we've had Toronto, we've had Renewal. Some of you, Latter Rain, like 40s and 50s. So really, some of you experienced that. But the Gen Z has never experienced an outpouring. Mm. And so I've been crying out to God. It's not just about youth. Don't, don't get it twisted. It's about all generations. But my point is they've never experienced something. Right. And so I want um, Rachel to lay hands on our youth 
and then we're not going to make you guys and make it awkward. Well, we will make it a little awkward. But I want us in humility, I want us in humility to receive prayer from them. Because there's something about, when you hear me, and this is the prophetic part of me, and so if I keep cracking it, it's because I'm discerning it. It's almost like we think we've arrived, or, or God's given up on us, or I'm old and God can't use me anymore. And I run into that mindset constantly in this valley. It's like the retirement mentality. Or it's just you disqualify yourself. God's not done with you. So it's going to require some humility. You're going to, want, you're going to walk up to a kid, and they're going to pray for you, and you're going to try to pray for them. Please don't do that. Give them an opportunity to pray. She's going to pray for them. So why don't we have the youth come up here? Rachel, won't you go down there and lay hands on them, those of you that want it. And then I know I'm going to get in line. And you're just going to pray for them and lay hands on them, and they're going to lay hands on us. Yeah. Just lay hands individually on each person. Worship team, I'd love it if you came... If you came up here, we'll pray, Rachel, release it. Ooh, Jesus. Ooh, these ones. These ones are important. <sighs> Thank you so much, Lord, for their sacrifice and for their willingness. And thank you for lighting them on fire. And he says, if you will be the oil, I will light the flame. Whoa, you, wow, you are a leader. Oh my goodness, wow, Lord. Lord, light them on fire. Mark these ones. They are going to be the change in their school. They're going to be the change in their environment. Lord, we ask for more, 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 more outpouring. Lord, more anointing, double, double what their parents have. Double what people have outpoured on them, Lord. More, more, more. Thank you for the anointing. Wow, Ezra. <laughs> Ezra and Aaron, you guys are leaders. You guys are going to lead people in your schools and in your environments to the Lord, and it's not going to be hard. It's not going to be hard. It's going to come so easily. Thank you, Jesus, for your anointing. And thank you, Jesus, for pouring it out on them. Thank you, Lord, for your fire. And thank you, Lord, for marking. We just pray for increase. We pray for increase. You guys, Jesus loves you so much. He loves you so much. You are princesses. You are his daughters. And he loves you so much. Lord, show them how much you love them. Lord, show them. Make them feel it tangibly. Thank you, Jesus, for your anointing. Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of Empowered Living Podcast by Empowered Life Church. We hope it blessed you. Subscribe so you can stay up to date with our latest podcasts. If you'd like to learn more about us, check us out at facebook.com slash ELC talent or check out our website www.empoweredlifechurch.org. Have a blessed week.